you're just starting out or maybe in the early stages of your filmmaking career, making money with a camera can seem like a never ending challenge. So when people ask you to work for free or for a rate that's much lower than you'd normally charge, it can make you want to punch a hole through your computer screen as you read the email. The first time it happened to me, I was living in Cambodia and just getting started as a photojournalist. And the thought that I wasn't valued enough to pay made me want to cry if I'm being honest. But since then, I've taken a bunch of jobs that either paid nothing or next to nothing. And most of the time, I'm pretty happy I did. I've made my entire income with a camera for more than a decade, and I'm still taking on unpaid work, even these days. There can be some huge benefits to working for free or super cheap under the right circumstances. And in this video, I'm going to get into five of the different times new filmmakers should at least think about leaving cash on the table. At the end of the video, I'll suggest a couple places you can go to even seek out unpaid jobs and also clarify the equally important times you should never work for free. But first, let's get into the good stuff. Hey guys, welcome back. And if you're new here, my name is Luke Forsyth. And on this channel, I teach the skills I've learned over 10 years working as a documentary filmmaker and photographer. If you're into that kind of thing, make sure to hit the subscribe button because I've got new videos coming out every Wednesday. First off, I think we need to reframe our perspective on the way we look at unpaid or really low paying gigs. If we just swap out the word free for volunteer or intern, it's suddenly not all that weird. People who are just starting out in new fields have been doing apprenticeships, internships, or even volunteering forever to gain the skills they need to be competitive and get a job. So why is it so weird to do the same thing as filmmakers? If you don't have much experience, contacts, or credits to your name, why would anyone want to hire you in the first place? Would you hire someone like that? I probably wouldn't. Of course, we'd all rather be paid, but sometimes there are very good reasons to pass on the money and still do the work. It's been under a year since I last volunteered, and if the right opportunity came my way again, I'd do it tomorrow. But the key thing to remember is that in order for it to be a volunteer opportunity rather than straight up exploitation, there has to be something in it for you. So let's get into five of the most common scenarios where the potential professional benefits are worth the financial strain. When you're just starting out, I'd say your first priority should be building up a one to two minute highlight reel as quickly as possible. As you get more experience and contacts, your reel becomes less and less important to the point where now I just generally send my resume and not a reel. But in the beginning, it's the only metric people have to judge your work by. When you cold call new agencies or production companies or when a production manager reaches out to you for the first time, the first thing they'll probably ask for is a link to your reel. If you're at the beginning of your journey and don't have at least 60 solid seconds of footage that showcase what you do, in my opinion, your first priority before you do anything else should be to get that together. As time goes on, swap out the weaker shots for stronger ones and get that thing looking as good as possible until one day you wake up and realize no one is asking for it anymore. But when you're just starting, it can be hard to get some of those amazing shots you want to stack your reel with. And here's when it can work in your favor to piggyback on other people's projects. If someone else is going to the trouble of bringing a crew together, uh, getting access to a difficult location or covering the hard cost of travel, you might be able to save yourself a lot of work by jumping on board when all that's already been taken care of and get yourself a handful of new shots or sequences for your reel without all the headaches involved in production. You won't get very far in the beginning without a reel, at least in my experience. So doing this a few times and making it as good as possible without spending a lot of money might save you a ton of time. Just make absolutely sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to your rights to use the footage you shoot for self-promotion before you start, or it could lead to some awkward misunderstandings. Okay, so maybe that's all well and good and you already have a reel that you're happy with, but the real problem is finding the right people to show it to. The longer I work in the documentary filmmaking world, the more I realize how small it is. There aren't really that many degrees of separation between working professionals, and people like to work with the people they already know. If you can manage to get in tight with a group of hardworking and motivated people, there's a good chance that those people will keep making stuff in the future and that they'll keep you in mind if you do a good job for them. And that is the second reason to work for free, if it helps you expand your network. It may not be fun or glamorous to talk about, 
but your network is super important in the world of filmmaking and growing it is one of the best ways to diversify your job prospects and stay busy. Do a good job for someone and the next time they're asked for a recommendation, they'll pass along your name. But getting your foot in the door can be incredibly difficult, especially if you don't have much of a reputation yet. Responding to requests for unpaid crew and then giving everything you have on shoot day is a really great way to get in someone's good books for the long term. And I'd even take this one step further and say that if you already know someone in your area that you really want to work with, I'd just straight up reach out and offer to work for free regardless of whether or not they're looking. You never know what it could lead to and it's pretty much always better to be out meeting people than sitting there watching gear reviews anyways. Are also antennas that pop. I've used it for the look that it gives you so many. It might take a long time for you to see any results like this, but try to think of it like planting seeds. You never know when one of them will sprout unexpectedly. Speaking of gear, getting your hands on the newest high-end stuff can be pretty tough unless you've got some rich friends or are sitting on a trust fund or something. Hey. You wanna be able to say that you have experience shooting Verite on an FX9 or C500, or that you're comfortable with complex interview lighting setups, or that you know how to sync audio across multiple cameras because you've done all those things before. But since you can't possibly buy all this stuff when you're starting out, the only way you're gonna get any practice with them is if someone else shows you how. And that's the third time I might cut my rates, if I think I can get a new and valuable skill out of it. Being able to set up and fly a professional level drone like an Inspire 2, or running a bulletproof backup system through Shotput Pro, or capturing sound from four audio sources at the same time, or setting up a Teradek wireless system so the director can remotely monitor picture are really useful skills to have as a working documentary filmmaker. And the more of these skills you have, the more likely you are to get the call when someone is looking to crew up for their next shoot. Or if you just wanna make your own projects, having a wide variety of skills and technical knowledge will help you push up your production value by spending money on the things that actually matter. A couple of years ago, I flew all the way to Texas to shoot a music video for free using all my own gear because I liked the director and because I wanted to see what it was like working with actors. As a documentary shooter, I'd always had to do the best I could with what was in front of me, and I'd never really had the chance to film with paid professionals that I could just position in whatever light I wanted. At the end of the shoot, I wouldn't say I was a master or anything, but at least I'd had real time blocking out scenes and giving direction to actors, and for me, that was worth not getting paid. So before you write off a snarky reply to the person asking you to work for lunch and gas money, Take a second to ask a few questions about the shoot and see if there isn't something that you might be able to benefit from learning. Throughout my whole career, first as a photographer and later as a filmmaker, I've always followed a principle that I call the rule of threes when it comes to building out my resume. We live in a time of bios and quick Google searches and all creative professionals need to be able to sell themselves and what they do within the character limits of a good search return. That means you wanna try and distill the core of your professional identity in a single sentence and the more powerful that that sentence, the better. Basically, the rule of threes means that you want to get the three highest quality client names into that sentence as soon as possible. And once you have them, you probably don't need to tweak it much more. When I was a photographer, that bio line was Luke Forsyth is a photojournalist based in Cambodia whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Time, and Al Jazeera. Those were three of the top news outlets in the region, and any prospective editor reading that would take me seriously as a professional. Later, when I moved into documentary production, it changed to Luke Forsyth is a documentary cinematographer and director who has worked with clients such as Netflix, National Geographic, and Showtime. There's something about the rhythm of three things, X, Y, and Z. That's really short, but authoritative at the same time. I'd suggest trying to build out your own version of a sentence like this as quickly as possible, and then work over time to get the highest quality names in there that you can. And that's the fourth reason to work for free. If you can get a good credit, or at least a better credit than the ones you already have, that can make you seem like a safe bet for anyone thinking about trying you out for the first time. When I was still shooting photos, I remember one night I stayed out all night at a violent protest in Phnom Penh and got some solid shots after all the other photographers had gone home. Then when I reached out to sell those photos to AFP, one of the biggest news agencies in the world, I was devastated to learn that they were only gonna offer me $25 for the rights to my pictures. I'd literally risked my life to get them, and even back then, the rate for hiring a photographer was around 300 bucks a day. It was a terrible deal, and I knew it. I'm not gonna lie to you and say it didn't bother me, because I was furious. 
25 bucks and free were pretty much the same thing to me when you consider that it didn't even cover the cost of my taxi and food for the day, let alone the value of my gear. And I seriously considered telling that guy where he could stick his $25. But at that time, I was still fairly new in the industry and had never published a photo in a major newspaper. So I decided to swallow my pride and give them the picture. Less than 24 hours later, that picture was on the front page of the New York Times. And from that day on, they started to give me most of their Cambodia related assignments. Then I got more and more calls from other outlets looking to hire me based on the credibility I had from working for the Times. And it's not an exaggeration to say that most of my career has stemmed from that moment. Looking back on it, if I'd known what that picture would do for me, I probably would have paid them to publish it. And I couldn't have cared less that I didn't get that much money up front. So if you think there's a chance to really level up your resume with a solid credit, I'd personally consider the lowball offer. Now this one comes with a weird warning because most high quality clients out there won't actually ask you to work for free. The New York Times would never have asked me to work for $25. It was only because I went through the news agency that I got that offer. So I wouldn't expect an email direct from Netflix to come in like this, but keeping your eye out for opportunities that might lead to a better credit than the ones you already have could pay off big time. Lastly is my personal reason to work for free. And it's just because you love or believe in the project. If someone is making something that you think could be really good, then absolutely cut your rates in order to be a part of it. If you think it's got the potential to be good, then odds are it might actually turn out well, which could get you a decent credit, expand your network, teach you new skills, get you some new material for your reel all at the same time. Filmmaking should be something that you actually like doing. And when there's a good team and a good story, it's even more enjoyable. I hope I never get to a point in my career where someone asks me to work on a project that I think is seriously cool and actually excites me, that I would ever walk away because of money alone. Now, if it's mediocre reality TV or a one-off interview shoot or something that I don't really feel passionate about, that's another situation and I would politely decline. But if someone had a time machine and told me I could go and be a part of the crew of one of my favorite documentaries like Restrepo or Cartel Land, I'd definitely cut my prices a bit. Okay, so there are five scenarios where I might think about working for free or at least cheaply. But again, I wanna repeat that the line between exploitation and volunteering is hazy. And the only way this is worth it is if you're getting something from it. If a project didn't either inspire me, promise to teach me something new, help me expand my network, or get me some good credits, I'd say no. If it's not a two-way street, I'd recommend you say no too. All right, so maybe I've sold you on the idea that sometimes it's good to work cheap. But where do you even start finding this work, even if it's for free? Personally, I found Facebook to be pretty good for this, which is probably the only thing it's good for these days other than buying used Ikea furniture. Where I lived in Canada, there's a group called I Need a Producer Slash Fixer Slash Crew Canada Edition. And I see posts every day of people looking for crew. Some are paid, some are low budget, and some are just straight up asking for volunteers. I'm guessing there's probably similar groups for where you live. So start trying to join them and see if there's any opportunities that might interest you. The other thing you could do is a little more direct. And that's by putting together a list of people in your area or region who you'd like to work with, and then just contacting them directly. I've done this many times, including recently you could offer to work as an AC or a PA on their next shoot, or if it's an aid organization, offer to make them a free video that they can post to social media. It's a little awkward in the beginning and a lot of people will probably ignore you, but the ones that get back to you could end up being the people who help take your career to the next level. Look, I get it, we all need money. Working for free isn't sustainable in the long term, and when you're good at what you do, you deserve to get paid. But there are also times when you can be flexible and gain big time in other ways than just financially. If you refuse on principle alone every time, you'll never know what you could be missing out on. Worst case scenario, order a ridiculously big lunch and get your value out of the production that way. Oh God, eats like a pig. Okay, that's it. Five times when working for free might make sense for new filmmakers. I hope you liked that one. And if you did, maybe think about subscribing so I can keep bringing these videos out every week. And if you wanna see more, maybe check out this other video I made about four entry-level jobs you can get as a new filmmaker. See ya.